Did you ever see Turbo? That's the 2013 animated movie starring Ryan Reynolds, Maya Rudolph, Samuel L. Jackson, and a long list of other great actors, all about a snail's dream to win the Indy 500. Didn't see it? You're not alone. It didn't do so well at the box office. Robert Siegel was one of the writers who worked on the screenplay for Turbo. When he was done with that project, Robert started working on writing the film that we're going to look at today. Released in 2016, the founder tells the story of Ray Kroc, who's played by Michael Keaton in the film, and the early days of McDonald's. Everyone knows what McDonald's is, but how well did the founder tell the story of how it became one of the most recognizable brands in the world? I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. Before we dig into the true story behind one of the world's largest fast food chains, let's set up our two truths and a lie game. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three facts. Two of them are true, which means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Ray Kroc called himself the founder of McDonald's. Number two, the restaurant that would become Burger King actually started before the first McDonald's. Number three, Dick and Mac McDonald sold their rights to McDonald's to Ray Kroc for $2.7 million. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, you'll find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episodes. And that means if you reach the end of the episode and you notice that there's only two of the facts mentioned, the third one is a lie. It's a simple process of elimination. But of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Oh, and while I've got you here, if you've ever wanted even more based on a true story, you can sign up to be an official producer of the show and get access to all of the past and future bonus episodes. Bonus episodes typically come out about once a month and are some of the more interesting articles or historical documents that I come across while researching episodes. Oh, and producers also get access to episodes early. So if you're listening to this on the day it's released, that's a Monday, But that means that producers have already had all weekend to give this episode a listen because they get episodes on Fridays. To learn more, hop on over to basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's version of The Founder. Are you familiar with the chicken or the egg principle? The dilemma is simple. If chickens come from an egg, what laid the egg? Of course, creationists settled this amongst the religious community in the 1600s by assuming that the first chicken was simply created. Therefore, it didn't come from an egg. But as I'm sure you can imagine, that didn't answer it for everyone. A little more recently, scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson solved the question when he tweeted on January 28, 2013, quote, Just to settle it once and for all, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The egg, laid by a bird that was not a chicken, end quote. Of course, this didn't answer it for everyone either. And thus, the question continues as a paradox that we'll probably never, ever have a universal consensus on. This dilemma is one that salesman Ray Kroc, who's played by Michael Keaton in the movie, poses as he speaks directly into the camera. Then we find out he's posing the question as a part of a sales pitch for a multi-mixer. His pitch, basically, suggests that perhaps the restaurant, which we can tell by a sign out front, is a place called Griffith's Drive-In, isn't selling enough milkshakes because the customers know it takes too long to make them something that can be fixed with his product. The unimpressed owner doesn't buy it, literally. (laughs) While that particular opening wasn't based on a specific event, the purpose of what we see in the movie is to get across the very real fact that Ray Kroc used to sell a product called a multi-mixer. And the real multi-mixer actually looked a lot like the device we see Michael Keaton lugging around in the film. 
although the movie doesn't really mention it, selling the multi-mixer was a big risk for the real Ray Kroc. You see, for almost two decades before, 17 years to be more specific, Ray sold paper cups for the Lily Tulip Corporation. He made about $35 a week at that job, which comes to about $350 in today's money. That's roughly $18,500 a year in today's salary. So, not really much to live on, especially since he had a wife and a young daughter to support. Of course, that's not all Ray did. He also taught piano on the side, but it still wasn't enough. So he decided to go all in on the Prince Castle Multi-Mixer, a device that sold for about $150 a pop. That's about $1,500 today. And while he certainly didn't see all of that for each sale, his commissions on a $150 multi-mixer were quite a bit more than for cheap paper cups. According to Ray's autobiography, the idea of switching from paper cups, which, well, it didn't make a ton of money, at least was something that had supported the family for the past 17 years, was something that his wife wasn't very supportive of at first. But Ray did well selling the multi-mixers, so she came around. Back in the movie, as he's trying to sell a multi-mixer, Michael Keaton's version of Ray Kroc gets a phone call about a restaurant out in California who wants to buy six multi-mixers. Surely, that must be a mistake, says Ray. No one makes that many milkshakes. He calls up the place out in California himself to verify, and sure enough, the order was correct. Actually, Nick Offerman's version of Dick McDonald tells Ray over the phone, you better make it eight multi-mixers. Astonished, Ray practically drops everything he's doing and drives out to where he is in Missouri to California to see this restaurant owned by Dick and Mac McDonald that needs so many multi-mixers. The basic gist of that is correct, but that's not really how it happened. In truth, it was a little bit more drawn out. As Ray was traveling around the country selling multi-mixers, he would hear about how all the restaurant owners from Oregon to Washington, D.C. wanted a multi-mixer like the McDonald brothers have in California. Naturally, Ray obliged to sell them the multi-mixers, but it also piqued his interest. Who were these McDonald brothers that everybody was mentioning? He decided to do a little bit more digging and found out that the McDonald brothers had a total of eight multi-mixers that had been sold to them. So, the number is right in the movie, it just didn't happen to come from a single order. Still, it was something that amazed Ray. Each of these multi-mixers had five spindles, so with eight machines, that would mean they could make 40 milkshakes at once. Granted, San Bernardino, California in 1954 had about 75,000 people living there, but that's hardly the metropolis like Chicago, St. Louis, Portland, or any of the other restaurants that were getting by fine with just one multi-mixer. So Ray decided to pay them a visit in person. The movie got that part right, although he didn't drive there. In reality, Ray hopped on a flight to Los Angeles, then drove the 60 or so miles to San Bernardino. In his autobiography, Ray recalls not being too impressed with McDonald's when he saw it for the first time. It was a rather nondescript, small, octagonal-shaped building that looked pretty much like any other drive-in restaurant in the mid-1950s. At about 11 o'clock a.m., McDonald's opened up and Ray took a seat in his car a little ways off to watch. When the line started to form, Ray noticed the workers inside McDonald's picked up their pace and met the impressive demand. That's when Ray got out of his car to see what the fuss was all about. He started by chatting with some of the folks in line and quickly found out that most of the people hadn't only eaten there before, but they were regulars. One of the guys said that he ate there every single day to avoid eating his wife's cold meatloaf sandwiches. In the movie, after meeting with Nick Offerman's Dick McDonald and John Carroll Lynch's Mac McDonald, Michael Keaton's version of Ray Kroc gets a tour of how McDonald's is able to make a burger in about 30 seconds, instead of the norm for many drive-ins at the time, about 30 minutes. Impressed, Ray asks the brothers to dinner to learn more about their story. That second part is true, but Ray didn't get a tour of the kitchen right away. After being thoroughly impressed with what he saw, Ray introduced himself and immediately hit it off with Dick and Mac who affectionately called him Mr. Multi-Mixer. They decided to have dinner that night so Ray could learn more about their restaurant. It's here 
in the movie that Dick and Mac tell him their story. And for the most part, the story that we hear in the movie is true. Like the movie says, the McDonald brothers came to California from New Hampshire. They'd done so after seeing their dad get fired from his job at a shoe factory for simply being too old. He wasn't any use to the factory anymore, who wanted younger employees. As you can imagine, that put a lot of financial stress on the family. Mac, his real name was Maurice, was determined to not let that happen to him. So he decided to move to California to strike it rich in Hollywood. By the way, the movie doesn't really mention it, but Mac was seven years older than Dick. Shortly after Mac moved out to Hollywood, in 1926, Dick joined his brother in California right after he graduated from high school. But as millions of others who have tried to become rich and famous in Hollywood can attest, their own big break didn't happen right away. To make a living, the brothers had an idea to start taking advantage of the increasing rate of cars on the road. Today, the idea of a lemonade stand is something we think of kids doing, but they started, quite literally, a juice stand, freshly squeezed orange juice for five cents a cup. Remember, this was the 1920s. No air conditioning, no climate control of any sort in the cars. Driving the streets in California was a hot, dusty affair. To lure in customers, the brothers put up some bright signs that would catch the eye of passers-by on the road who would gladly pay for a chance at a fresh, cool drink. But the stand wasn't enough to pay their bills. Besides, they didn't come to California to sell orange juice. That's when, like the movie also correctly explains, the brothers started working at Columbia Studios, doing mostly manual labor like setting up lights and things like that. In the movie, the brothers tell Ray over dinner that they saved up their money working at Columbia until they could buy their own movie theater in Glendora, California. But it was bad timing because that was September of 1929. That's true, although the timing isn't quite right. According to Ray Kroc's autobiography, it was actually 1932 when the brothers bought their movie theater. But the result was the same. Starting a business was never easy, and with the country going through the Great Depression, followed by World War II, it was even more difficult. The brothers learned a really important lesson, though, about squeezing more than oranges, but rather squeezing their wallets. There would be some days that they would only eat a single meal, a hot dog from a small stand by their theater. According to the movie, that hot dog stand was run by someone named Wiley Reed, I couldn't find anything to verify that, but it is true that the hot dog stand was one of the inspiration for the McDonald brothers starting their own restaurant. After about five years, they decided to pull the plug on their movie theater. The movie says this restaurant was a hot dog and orange juice stand, which I'm guessing was because of the orange juice stand that they had, the real McDonald brothers had after moving out to California. But the truth is, when the McDonald brothers started their restaurant, it was a barbecue restaurant. But it was, just like the movie says, in Arcadia, California. Although, to be fair, the movie mentions the brothers moved their stand to San Bernardino in 1940 and then opened up McDonald's famous barbecue. That's pretty close to what really happened. Their restaurant in Arcadia was called Airdrome, something that they named it because it was right next to what's now an abandoned airfield in Arcadia known as the Monrovia Airport, or more formally, Foothill Flying Field. But back then, there was an airport there. As you can probably guess, with their background running a theater, setting up lights on a movie set and squeezing orange juice, they didn't have much actual restaurant experience. But they had a friend who knew how to make barbecue, so they learned pretty quick. But as it turns out, selling barbecue by an airfield wasn't what the brothers had in mind either. It's worth pointing out, though, that the airfield was still pretty popular. In fact, Foothill Flying Field stayed in operation until 1953 and even had a couple movies shot there in its heyday. Oh, and as a fun little fact for you, remember Poncho Barnes from when we learned about the true story behind the movie The Right Stuff? She frequented Foothill Flying Field in the 1930s. Did she ever run into the McDonald's brothers? Guess we'll never know. According to the movie, The McDonald's brothers actually packed up their entire building from Arcadia and moved it to San Bernardino. That's true. It cost them about 200 bucks, or about 2,500 in today's dollars, to chop up their wooden octagonal stand, chop it in half, 
and transport it to a new spot that they'd gotten in San Bernardino with the help of a $5,000 loan from Bank of America. Since they weren't near an airfield anymore, the name Aerodrome didn't make much sense, so the brothers decided to keep it simple, McDonald's Barbecue. But even after all of this, including moving to a bigger town in San Bernardino, their restaurant wasn't taking off like they'd hoped. That's not to say they weren't popular. They were. Their parking lot in San Bernardino was almost packed full. But it still wasn't enough to solidify their future. Something, if you remember, was a big driver for their move from New Hampshire to California years before. So, just like the movie says, the brothers decided to take a really big risk. They were convinced they could solidify their future if they catered to drivers. McDonald's barbecue at the time was following the same model as a typical drive-in, complete with attractive young girls as car hops. As a little side note, car hops are still in use today by drive-ins, most notably the fast food chain Sonic. In the 1940s though, car hops were almost exclusively pretty young girls because restaurant owners quickly caught on to a common denominator during World War II. That is simply that most of the clientele for a lot of drive-ins tended to be military men, younger military men, in fact. So, quite simply, a pretty girl sold more food, and that element of sexism flourished even after the war. Oh, and the term car hop itself came from one of those girls hopping onto the running board of a car as a way of claiming the patron inside as their own. McDonald's barbecue was doing well as a drive-in, but the brothers were still barely making a profit. They didn't seem to think the amount of work that they were putting into their restaurant was warranting their return. But they were convinced the wave of the future was to cater to drivers, just like they had done with the orange juice stand years earlier. In 1948, the brothers did something no one in business does when they shut down their very successful restaurant and overhauled it in an attempt to make it even more successful. They did pretty much all the things that the movie mentions, slimming down their menu to burgers, fries, and a drink, and creating an assembly line process to deliver food quickly and with high quality. And that last part was key. You might not really think of McDonald's burgers as being high quality today, but from all of the research I could find, everyone seems to agree that the original restaurant run by the McDonald's brothers had amazing food. It was only after Ray Kroc entered the picture that quality started to be sacrificed for quantity. But that's getting ahead of our story. When they reopened their restaurant simply as McDonald's, it was a hit. All of this was something the movie very cleverly explains as the McDonald's brothers have dinner with Michael Keaton's version of Ray Kroc. And while that dinner did happen, from what I could gather, it would seem they went over how their operation worked more at that dinner than a full history of their restaurant. Since, if you recall, Ray didn't jump to a tour of their kitchen right away, like we saw in the movie. But regardless, the movie is correct in showing that Ray was hooked. He knew there was something special about McDonald's. Although, in the movie, it's Ray Kroc who mentions the idea of franchising to the brothers, According to Ray's autobiography, it was Dick McDonald who wondered aloud at one of their early conversations who they could get to open similar restaurants, to which Ray replied, what about me? Oh, and the movie is also correct in mentioning that the brothers already tried franchising before Ray came into the picture. In the morning after their dinner, the brothers mentioned there's five McDonald's locations three in Southern California, one in Sacramento, and one in Phoenix. In truth, there were 10 other McDonald's, most in California, but with two in Arizona. Just like the movie shows, though, Ray agreed with the brothers at the rate of 1.9% gross sales from any franchisees he brought on board. Actually, Ray asked for 2%, but the brothers said 1.9% sounds better to the franchisees because it sounds a lot less than the full and rounded 2%. With that and a 10-year contract with the McDonald's brothers, Ray Kroc was no longer in the multi binkser business. At least, that's what the movie implies. Well, not really. In truth, one of the reasons Ray was so excited about McDonald's in the beginning was his idea that he might be able to open a new McDonald's somewhere and then sell them eight multi-mixers. 
So he still saw that as a way he would be making money out of this deal. While the movie doesn't really mention it, a franchise fee for starting McDonald's in 1954 was $950, or about $8,600 today. For some comparison, a quick search online shows that the franchise fee today is about $45,000, plus building costs and other costs that can get up into the millions of dollars depending on where your new McDonald's is going to be located. Back in the movie, the first store that Ray Kroc opens is in Des Plaines, Illinois. One of the first indicators in a change of attitude with Michael Keaton's version of Ray comes when he calls Dick McDonald to talk about a change to their building design. As the movie explains, the change is to put in a basement. They need that so they can add a furnace. After all, Illinois is a little bit colder than California, so the building design didn't have to think about putting in a furnace in California. As the movie would have us believe, Dick agrees that they need a furnace, but that they need to have their architect look at the proposed changes to make sure it's done right. Upset at the delay, Ray slams down his phone and ends up just going ahead and doing it anyway. Maybe that's how it happened, but Ray Kroc's autobiography would say something different. When Ray called the McDonald's brothers and asked if he could put a basement with a furnace at his first location in Displains, their reply was, then of course he could. Ray asked for a registered letter approving the change, something that his contract with the McDonald's said he needed. They said, just go ahead and do it. They didn't need the letter. Even the McDonald's brothers' lawyers didn't seem to help. When Ray's lawyer asked the McDonald's lawyer what he should do if they don't provide an official letter saying that the change was all right, it was swept under the rug as Ray's problem, not the brothers'. Of of course, that's Ray's side of the story. Unfortunately, neither of the McDonald's brothers wrote an autobiography or really documented things nearly as well as Ray did. So, we only have one side. As they say, history is written by the winners. Something else the movie doesn't really mention was something Ray Kroc claimed to have been a major source of friction between him and the McDonald's brothers early on. You see, according to their contract, the 10 McDonald's restaurants already in business could keep their names, but any other stores opened in the U.S. had to go through Ray. Well, as it turns out, after getting the Des Plaines, Illinois McDonald's off the ground, Ray found out that the McDonald's brothers had sold the rights to an ice cream company in Cook County, Illinois, right near where Ray was working to build up his own McDonald's as per his agreement with the brothers. That didn't make Ray too happy, and he ended up having to spend $25,000 to get the rights back from the ice cream company. And that was $25,000 that, according to Ray, he didn't have to spend at the time. He was in major debt at that point, mostly living off money made from selling multi-mixers and dumping all of that into McDonald's. Now, we haven't really talked about this aspect of the movie much yet, but it's clear from the storyline of the film that... All of this was putting a lot of stress on Ray's marriage. That would be to Ethel, who's played by Laura Dern in the movie. And that whole strain on the relationship was true. Although, if you remember, I mentioned Ray and Ethel had a daughter. The movie doesn't mention her at all, but her name was Marilyn, and she was born in 1924, two years after Ray and Ethel were married. With all of the travel, business, and obsession with work, Ray and Ethel's marriage strained to the point of divorce in 1961. In the movie, a lot of this strain is also brought on by the presence of another woman. That'd be Joan Smith, who's played by Linda Cardellini in the film. In the movie, Joan is married to Patrick Wilson's character, Raleigh Smith, when Ray meets her. The latter wants to become a McDonald's franchisee, and after meeting Joan, we see a late-night phone call between the two where Ray starts talking about how it's a shame that others can't think big like Joan does. As viewers, we get the idea that Ray is talking about his wife Ethel there, and Joan thinks the same issue of her husband Raleigh. The specifics of the conversation were made up, of course, but that general sense is pretty accurate, but it's still not the full story. You see, Joan Smith was a real person, and she really was married to a woman named Raleigh when Ray met her, although Raleigh wasn't the steakhouse owner that we saw in the movie. According to Ray's autobiography, the fact that they were both married was one of the reasons they had to ignore the spark they both felt when they met for so long. 
but it seemed that was delaying the inevitable. In 1961, Ray Kroc divorced Ethel after 39 years of marriage when he realized that he was falling for Joan. In the divorce, Ethel got the house, the car, the insurance, just like the movie shows. Ray gave Ethel everything he had, except for McDonald stock. Oh, and she also got $30,000 a year for the rest of her life. So Ray was single now, but Joan was not. While he was waiting for Joan to get divorced, Ray fell for actor John Wayne's secretary, a woman named Jane Dobbins, that he had met through a mutual friend. In 1963, only two weeks after meeting Jane, Ray married her. But that didn't last for real long either. In 1968, Ray divorced Jane and in 1969 finally married Joan, who he remained married to for the rest of his life. We haven't talked about him yet, but back in the movie, there's a moment when Harry Sonnenborn meets Ray Kroc, and it's a bit of a revelation for Ray. Harry is played by B.J. Novak in the film. After reading through his ledger, Harry tells Ray that there's a big problem. You don't seem to realize what business you're in. You're not in the burger business, Harry tells him. You're in the real estate business. That particular scene was made up for the film, but the basic gist was correct. It was Harry's idea that McDonald's shift their focus from being a burger restaurant and instead look at becoming a real estate company. That's when McDonald's really started to take off. Harry's idea was to convince landowners to set up a subordinate lease on their unused land. Basically, the landowners were agreeing to let McDonald's act like the owners of the land so they could lease it out to franchisees. The landowners then would get whatever they agreed to in the deal. So the benefit for the landowners was that they would be able to turn vacant land into a revenue stream without doing much work. McDonald's would do it all. On the other side, Harry figured out how to charge the franchisees enough to cover their own mortgage to the landowners and overhead costs while still making a profit for themselves. Lastly, the franchisees were able to own their stores and turn a profit using the McDonald's name and formula that was still revolutionary in the 1950s. Sure, the fast food restaurant that would eventually become Burger King started in 1953, but it didn't really start to expand until much later. McDonald's was turning into a money-making machine for everyone involved. Going back to the movie, at the end of the movie, Michael Keaton's version of Ray Kroc basically forces out the McDonald's brothers, who eventually agree to a $2.7 million buyout. And that's true, even down to the amount. $2.7 million or $1 million for each of the two brothers after the taxes were paid. That was in 1961, so if you recall, that was the same year Ray divorced Ethel. $2.7 million then is about the same as $22 million today. Not too bad, but certainly not the level of money that McDonald's was worth. Oh, and the movie was also correct in showing that Ray Kroc didn't hold true to the agreement of 1% of company profits in perpetuity. But something the movie doesn't really mention is Ray's side of that. Again, history is being written by the winners, so take this with a grain of salt. We really don't know how much of this is actually true, but it would seem that the original McDonald's brothers refused to fulfill part of the deal when they sold their rights to Ray Kroc, namely that original restaurant they started in San Bernardino. They refused to give it to Ray. So, in turn, Ray refused to give them their percentage of McDonald's profits. Today, that would be well over $100 million a year compared to McDonald's earnings today at about 0.5% for each brother. After selling out their rights in 1961, Ray Kroc went on to continue with the claim that he was the founder of McDonald's, something that we see shown in the movie. Oh, and as a little fun fact, in 1974, Ray's involvement in the day-to-day -day operation started to dwindle, so he turned to a different industry as he bought the San Diego Padres baseball team. In 1977, Ray's autobiography was released, and that same year, he stepped down as president of McDonald's and moved into a senior chairman role that really removed him from most of the goings-on at McDonald's. That Ray Kroc considered himself the founder of McDonald's was something that confused a lot of people who knew the true story, something that Ray himself didn't seem to hide in his autobiography. It's not like he ever pretended like the McDonald's brothers didn't exist, and yet he continued to refer to himself as the founder of McDonald's. 
After Ray Kroc stepped down as president in 1977, he was replaced by the grill operator turned businessman Fred Turner. In the movie, Fred is played by Justin Randall Brooke. In 1984, Ray Kroc passed away at the age of 81. He never changed his story about being the founder. As for the McDonald brothers, unfortunately, the movie is pretty accurate in depicting what happened to them. Some of Mac's relatives have since gone on record to say that this failure to secure the percentage of McDonald's profits were a major contributing factor to the heart attack that took his life in 1971. And yes, McDonald's did force them to change the name of their original restaurant, so it was renamed to the Big M. But a new McDonald's opened up a block away in 1967, and the Big M in San Bernardino went out of business. As for Dick McDonald, he would end up moving back to New Hampshire. He was credited, as the movie shows, being the one who came up with the idea for the Golden Arches, as well as being the one who grilled the very first hamburger at a McDonald's restaurant. But then, in 1991, Fred Turner changed the official story of McDonald's by changing their Founders Day that formerly honored Ray Kroc as the founder to honoring Ray alongside the two McDonald brothers. As Fred explained the change in an interview at the time, the McDonald's brothers were the founders of the concept while Ray was the founder of the company that developed the concept into the largest food service organization in the world. After Ray Kroc's death, Joan spent the remainder of her years as a philanthropist. She started by trying to donate the San Diego Padres to the city of San Diego, but that's against Major League Baseball's rules, so she just sold it and went about the process of giving away their fortune. In 1997, she donated $15 million to the region of Grand Forks, North Dakota to help with recovery efforts after they suffered what's called the Red River Flood, the worst flooding they'd had since 1826. The money was given anonymously until a journalist managed to track down the source, which led to Joan admitting that it was her. There were always small donations here and there. Well, small for a billionaire, I guess. But then in 2002, she donated $1.6 billion to the Salvation Army. Yes, that's billion with a B. Joan Kroc died on October 12th, 2003. And in November, her estate followed through with one of her final wishes to make another donation. This time... It was in the amount of $225 million to National Public Radio, NPR, that single-handedly increased NPR's budget for 2004 by 50%. In fact, if you're listening to this, then I'm going to go out on a limb and assume you've heard some of the great podcasts put together by NPR. NPR launched their very first podcasts in August of 2005, an area of expansion that was possible thanks to the donation from Joan Kroc. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. To learn more about Ray Kroc, I'd recommend picking up Ray's autobiography called Grinding It Out, The Making of McDonald's. Sure, that's all from Ray's point of view, so there's bound to be some bias in there, but it's still a good read that dives way deeper into the details of a lot of the story than we can get from anywhere else. Another great book I'd recommend is Ray and Joan, The Man Who Made the McDonald's Fortune and the Woman Who Gave It All Away by Lisa Napoli. I'll add links to those books and plenty more resources to begin your deep dive into the life of Ray Kroc and the rise of McDonald's over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the answer to the two truths and a lie game, here's another five-star review. This one is a very brief review from Andrea over on Facebook, and it says, Just started the podcast and I have fallen in love. There are several episodes, movies, that I didn't think I would be into, but found myself looking forward to commute times to finish up the episodes, hoping to support you on Patreon soon. <laughs> now, if you've listened to the Becoming Jane episode from last month, you'll know that Andrea did become a patron of the show and picked up that movie to cover. 
Of course, that pushed it to the front of the other episodes that I recorded, which is why that episode came out first. But that's neither here nor there. Thank you so much, Andrea. I really appreciate the kind words and support. Okay, now it's time to get to the answer to our two truths in a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a quick refresher, though, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Ray Kroc called himself the founder of McDonald's. Number two, the restaurant that would become Burger King actually started before the first McDonald's. Number three, Dick and Mac McDonald sold their rights to McDonald's to Ray Kroc for $2.7 million. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number two. As we learned, even if briefly, Burger King was founded in the early 1950s, while the first McDonald's was founded in 1948. Technically, it was in 1953 when Insta Burger King was founded in Jacksonville, Florida, but then it was renamed to Burger King the next year. So that's sort of similar to the McDonald's story, at least as far as the name is concerned, since McDonald's was used, used to be McDonald's barbecue before switching to burgers and simply being named McDonald's, <laughs> or maybe that's not really the same. So now that you know a little more about the true story behind McDonald's, what do you think? Are you still a fan of the Golden Arches? Or maybe you've never been a fan of them. Either way, consider this your official invitation to join the Based on a True Story Facebook group and share your thoughts with the community. You can unlock access to bonus episodes by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support, or find an entire archive of episodes for free right now at the show's home on the web at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.